So um, we're going to pick up with the hypothalamus. That's the call of this lecture. So we're going to start off with a discussion on the anatomy of the hypothalamus. Okay, so the, the tissue of the hypothalamus is comprised of what are known as nuclei. And really, the nuclei of the hypothalamus are bundles of cells comprised of nervous tissue. And there's actually a lot of stuff that happens in these different nuclei inside of the hypothalamus. And what we're going to focus on is the endocrine function. Okay. And so we have some hormones that are produced here that are going to interact with the pituitary to be released um, from a relationship between the, the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And so the, the way I want to kind of break this down is I want to look at the experiment. Because ultimately what it comes down to is the hypothalamic function. Defined by these nuclei, but these nuclei are defined by not their anatomy, but their function. Okay. So the first experimental data set I want to take a look at. I'm just going to call that experiment number one. It's going to involve a surgical procedure to remove the pituitary. So it's going to take an experimental organism. Let's say that it's a rat. And we remove the pituitary from the rat. Then what we do is we go through and we evaluate characteristics of other endocrine organs or tissues within that organism. So basically we do a survival procedure, remove the pituitary tissue, allow the animal to recover, they go through life for a little while, then we sacrifice the animal and we start to look at other tissues. So when we observe the adrenal cortex. The adrenal cortex is going to have gone under, undergone atrophy. So atrophy is this idea that it's actually going to decrease in its overall size. If we look at the gonadal tissue, if it's a male, we're looking at the testes. If it's a female, we're looking at the ovarian tissue and the uterine horns. These tissues will have atrophy as well. If we look at the thyroid, Same thing. We're going to see atrophy in those tissues as well. Okay. So let's kind of put that data in our minds. And then let's do a second experiment where this time, once we remove the pituitary, we replace that pituitary. in the kidney, and specifically within what's called the capsule. This is the outer tissue on the kidney. And the reason that we're putting it there is because this is going to prevent revascularization of the pituitary. So we're going to have the pituitary present, but we're not going to have a blood supply. So there's going to be no blood supply to interact with the pituitary in the kidney capsule and the rest of the organs. And what we end up seeing when we go and look at the adrenal cortex, the gonads, the thyroid, is the same observations. We end up with Kind of take that in context, and let's do a third experiment here, or a third variation. This time, we're going to take the pituitary out, and we're going to replace the pituitary under the hypothalamus. 
under the hypothalamus. Now what's observed is we actually have prevascularization of the tissue. And with that revascularization, if we do this right away, we see no observable atrophy. If we actually do this in an organism where we've seen atrophy of those organs, and then we replace, we see those organs actually go through hypertrophy, and so they actually regain their size. So this time, when we have blood supply, we actually are going to end up with organ hypertrophy. So if we conclude anything from these experiments, clearly the pituitary gland requires a connection to the circulatory circuit in order to maintain organ size or function. All right, let's take a look at a second set of experiments. So experiment number two. So this time I'm going to start out with a mature female rat. And in this mature female rat, I'm going to leave the hypothalamus intact. But I'm going to surgically remove the pituitary. Yeah, it's, it's just some model organism, some mammal. Uh, but we said probably a rat would work well for experiment number one as well. Okay, so now we're dealing with a mature female rat. So it's an aged animal that's female. We leave the hypothalamus intact, we remove the pituitary. And one of the observations that we make here is this animal goes into an estrus, which means there is no longer a menstrual cycle, no menses. Now, in the, uh, in the rat and in mice as well, the uh, reproductive cycle is about four to five days. So this is very easy, quick to be able to observe. Mature rat, intact hypothalamus, removed pituitary, and we've messed up the menstrual cycle. So basically, the animal just sits in the same uh, in the same condition in terms of the menstrual cycle. If you look at the vaginal sphericle on the cell screen, uh, the vaginal cavity, those change during the menstrual cycle. We end up with a uh, cells that are uh, basically stuck in this epithelial, uh, uh, this state of epithelial uh, cortification, so that the cells look like scales, and they don't go through a process of regenerating forms. Uh, All right, so. Observation one for experiment two. Observation two for experiment two. This time we're going to take an immature rat who's male. Immature rail, an immature male rat. And he is going to act as a donor. Okay, so this immature male rat. Immature male rat, not a rape. And this immature male rat is going to act as a donor. The way we're going to process this animal is we'll remove pituitary. And take that pituitary as an intact organ and place it in the female. Observations from part one of this experiment, what should be happening in terms of the estrus cycle for a female rat without a pituitary? 
no, no menstruation, no cycle. When we place the male pituitary in the female ma, uh, rat without a pituitary, we reestablish a estrus. Okay, so from experiment one, I think we definitely can probably say in order for the pituitary gland to function, it needs to be connected to the bloodstream. In addition, what we really notice is not only does it need to be connected to the bloodstream, but it helps if it can function or if it can be connected to the hypothalamus as well. But that's a little bit more vague. Because, I mean, we didn't ever put it anyplace else. We didn't put the, the pituitary gland, let's say, in tissue in the leg or whatever. We do this, right? So, okay, what's your question? Then what's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> it was a funny thought with the fitter and the first <laughs> If you are watching this video on YouTube right now, I just want to explain that I am not Canadian. I'm from Minnesota. And this morning for breakfast, I had a Coke and a potato and a bagel. <laughs> and currently, I live in one of the biggest redneck capitals in America, Cleveland, Georgia. <laughs> And they do not like Yankees. <laughs> and I'm leaving that in there. All right, so the other big conclusion here is that the hypothalamus must be involved in the control or the regulation of the pituitary. Or at least the anterior side of the pituitary. Right? Now the reason that we conclude that is because all of the observations that we've just made are known to be linked to the hypothalamus as well. And so if we have the hypothalamus intact and the pituitary intact, we see hypertrophy of these organs. If we remove the hypothalamus, we lose hypertrophy of those organs. If we remove the pituitary, we lose hypertrophy of those organs. So the hypothalamus and the pituitary have to collectively be together. And it turns out we can do additional experiments and we can uh, begin to characterize and identify, biosynthesize these hormones that are being produced, right? So we're able to confirm this through our experiments done very early on before a lot of these molecules were characterized. We just kind of knew, okay, there's something that's being produced by these organs that's causing these changes that we're observing. Okay. So fast forward. And based off of these early observations, this took us down a experimental path, a research path for a number of years that led to the characterization of what's now known as the parvocellular neurosecretory system. So the parvocellular neural secretory system. So remember that the hypothalamus is comprised of multiple nuclei. Those nuclei are bundles of cells, nervous tissue, that pro provide various physiological functions for an organism. The parvocellular neural secretory system is a small group of neurons that arise in one of those nuclei called the PDA, which is the paraventricular nucleus. These neurons run from the paraventricular nucleus. So here we have paraventricular nucleus that's represented. They run down 
through what's known as the median eminence. So this is the hypothalamus anatomically here is the hypothalamus. This is what's called the infundibulum or the stalk of the pituitary, the very top of that stalk at its highest point or its most eminent point is called the median eminence. It's medial, that's where median comes from and it's eminent because it's at the top of the structure. So these small neurons arising in the paraventricular nucleus have their axons that travel to the median eminence. Which is technically part of the pituitary pituitary gland. Now, these neurons arising from the paraventricular nucleus, crossing through the median eminence, they terminate and interact, form synapses, synapses. With a primary plexus. A term that we're using to describe this bundle of capillaries that exist close to the median eminence within the infundibulum of the pituitary. So we basically have nervous system supply that comes down and terminates or interacts with this capillary bed here that's going to extend down to a second capillary bed down here. Now some of you already know oops, some of you already know what this system is called. Circulatory circuit is specifically okay, very good. Hypophyseal portal system. A hypophyseal portal system is interacting with these neurons arising from the paraventricular nucleus, and this is known as the, par the parvocellular neural circulatory system. This interaction between cellular neurosecretory cells and the hypophyseal portal system allows stimulating cues to come from the hypothalamus to interact with the cells of the anterior pituitary. has some sort of control over the pituitary. Anatomically, we now can see between the parvocellular nuclear neurosecretory system and the hypophyseal portal system that we have an anatomical way to distribute molecules from the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland very efficiently. And it turns out that we have a bunch of hormones produced in the hypothalamus that interact with the anterior pituitary to cause the function of the anterior pituitary to change. And that's what I want to do now is I want to talk through those hormones. We're going to start out with thyrotropin releasing hormone. It's abbreviated TRH. Many of our hormones are going to be abbreviated. Okay, thyrotropin releasing hormone for TRH. Thyrotroid, thyrotropin releasing hormone is exactly three amino acids in length. Its sequence, its amino acid sequence, is glutamic acid, histidine, and proline.
So this is TRH in its final physiological form. Tetanic acid is to be controlled. However, it starts out as a pro TRH that has 255 amino acid residues. And it turns out that within these 255 amino acid residues, we have five different repeats or occurrences of this sequence plus an additional amino acid, which is glycine. So from a single gene, pro G R H, we can modify this, post-translationally modified, to produce up to five physiologically active molecules of TRH. And when TRH is released from the hypothalamus, the axis that we follow is for TRH to interact with the pituitary, the anterior pituitary to release a hormone called thyroid stimulating hormone, which circulates to the thyroid. And in the thyroid produces two hormones, T3 and T4. So how does TRH actually stimulate the cells of the pituitary that produce TSH? We already know the beginning to that question. What do I need in the cell membrane of TRH? Or, I'm sorry, of the cells that produce TSH? How do we always respond to a molecule? We need a, a receptor, okay? So, TRH, when it's produced, circulates to those cells that produce TSH. Those are called thyrotropins. Those are the cell, the, the uh, I'm sorry, thyrotropins are what are released. They're produced by the cells, by cells from the thyrotrophs. So talking about the thyrotrophs here, right? So what happens in the thyrotrophs? TRH binds to a receptor. It happens to be a G protein linked receptor. That G protein linked receptor activates an enzyme called PLC. Already you should all know where this is going. What is the next step after PLC? What is PLC first? Anyone remember? So, the multiple classes that you've taken, hopefully, running the PLC before. I'll give you a, I'll give you a, uh, some another another thing to think about that maybe gets you going in the right direction. This is not the same cell signaling system that activates adenylate cyclase. This is another one. PLC is phospho. It's phospholipase C. And what do we know about phospholipase C? It cleaves or breaks apart a lipid. And what lipid does it do that to? It is a phospholipid. What specific phospholipid? Nope, it does not start with a C. It might start with a P. And end in a dip too. PIP2. So we're talking about a PIV2 pathway. And so when PLC is activated, you'll remember, hopefully, I end up with IP3, and I end up with a second molecule DEG. So I take PIP2, and I split it apart, and I get 
an acetyl triphosphate, and I get diacetylglycerol. IP3 is, remember, soluble in the cytosol. So that starts floating around in the cytosol. DAG is still lipid, and so it remains up in the membrane. What's next after this? Well, calcium. So from the IP3, we end up having an increase in calcium levels inside of the cell. From DAG, we actually initiate a sequence of events that results in the transcription of the TSH gene. So TRH actually causes the transcription of TSH, whereas when we increase calcium because of the presence of IP3, the strand that's produced is caused to be released. So we release, cause the release of the strand of TSH. So DAG is going to cause the gene to be produced. The increase in calcium to be away from IP3 is going to cause that produced hormone, the TSH, to be released into the bloodstream. So that's our kind of main mechanism here for TRH, that's the main purpose for TRH. But we have a lot of times in a lot of different endocrine systems this idea that's known as crosstalk. Crosstalk is this idea that some of our hormones actually will cause some other things to happen. And TRH happens to be a crosstalk hormone. TRH is also going to stimulate the release of prolactin. And then under pathophysiological conditions, TRH has been shown to be able to release growth hormone. Now, don't take that as being you get a huge amount of prolactin. It just causes some prolactin release. Its main purpose is what I described there with the PIP2 pathway. Okay, so that's our first hormone substance. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, hypothalamic substance. Second hypothalamic substance is somatostatin. Somatostatin actually has a different name. Its other name is growth hormone inhibiting substance. Growth hormone inhibiting substance. So there's actually going to be this dance or this balance that occurs with hypothalamic hormones. One of the hormones that's going to be produced from the anterior pituitary is called growth hormone. Growth hormone is regulated in positive and negative directions by hypothalamic hormones. Somatostatin has a negative influence on growth hormone. Whereas a hormone called growth hormone releasing hormone, hormone releasing hormone, has a positive influence on growth hormone. <clears throat> By the way, your textbook has a list of all the different tools So if you're like, I don't know what SS2 is. Don't look it up at the beginning of the book. You find out, oh, that's nice. Okay. This is an arrow. Really nice to draw an arrow. Turns out somatostatin has some other controls or crosstalk, but it also is produced by some other tissues as well. So not only is it regulating when and how growth hormone is produced and, and released, but it also is going to have some 
really some, some digestive and central nervous system function. So it regulates the gut, has some gut regulation capabilities, some regulation in the central nervous system. It's produced also by the pancreas. And it turns out that somatostatin is a chaperone for insulin and glucagon. Okay, so insulin and glucagon basically have opposite effects on mammals. So insulin, you all know, right? What does insulin do? It causes your blood sugars to go down. Glucagon causes them to go back up, okay? And the way that sometimes this has been described is that these two molecules, they kind of have to dance together. And, well, somatostatin. Somatostatin comes in and chaperones that dance and makes sure that insulin doesn't get too handsy. Make sure that the control levels, the level of control, keeps insulin from being overly, um, overly expressed, causing huge drops in blood sugar, or glucagon doesn't cause huge increases in blood sugar. So we're, we're tightly regulating our glucose levels. You have two hormones that help to regulate that, and then another hormone that helps to regulate the rate of those. So there's also some inhibitory uh, feedback loops that somatostatin is involved in. Somatostatin is going to inhibit the release of TRH, which we just talked about, which ends up modifying the release of TSH as well. Because if we don't have the releasing hormone for the stimulating substance, we can't produce that or release that stimulating substance. However, what's kind of crazy about this is if you go back in your notes, what does TRH also do? Well, it also seems to have some regulatory uh, stimulation on prolactin. The somatostatin does not affect that. Or inhibit TRH's release. So there's some different mechanisms that are being inhibited by somatostatin when it comes to TRH. And now I think I can officially welcome you to the bizarre world of Because, I mean, if you start to think about it, if you have a tumor that develops that starts to pump out somatostatin, which can happen, all of a sudden you have upregulation of a bunch of stuff that's not even related to the inhibition of growth hormone. You have things like your thyroid that begins to be affected because you're inhibiting TRH and TSH release. And so there's all of this crosstalk that kind of comes up as things begin to go pathological. The other thing, too, is even just natural interactions. You may be thinking, okay, I'm regulating this substance. Let's say I'm regulating testosterone, and that affects wheel running. And it turns out that maybe it's not testosterone. Maybe it's the way you're regulating testosterone regulates another molecule, and it's that molecule that all of a sudden is the, the, the culprit in regulation of that particular nutrient. So it's really, really complex. Yeah, I highly recommend that you not go to my book sometimes. What did I say? Do not become an endocrinologist. Do something easy like body or bigger body. She like right behind me with a knife right now. 
<laughs> All right, um, gonadotropin releasing hormone. Um, so this is the hormone that eventually is going to result in changes to both ovarian tissue in the females, testicular tissue in the males. GnRH is released from the hypothalamus and stimulates the release of LH. And FSH. LH is luteinizing hormone, FSH is follicle stimulating hormone. Now, when we start to look at the release of GNRH. So this figure here, this is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Hypothalamus is releasing GnRH, and the way that it releases GnRH is it's actually going to pulse it, have these pulses. So we classify it as being pulsatile. And so it's not a consistent release of this particular hormone. It pulses. And this pulse wave here can actually kind of be interpreted like a barcode that carries different information. And the pulse will actually change the number of pulses in the unit of time, which we would call frequency. That frequency can change. When the frequency changes, this results in changes in gonadotropin release. You can have trouble with the LH and FSH. So it turns out that the change that occurs is actually what gonadotropin of the two is preferentially being released in higher concentration. So as we decrease the frequency or the number of pulses, your FSH levels begin to go up. When we increase the number of pulses or increase the frequency, we'll see LH levels begin to go up. What's really interesting here is if we go from a, a pulse tile to a continuous release of our gonadotropin, we would observe that both LH and FSH begin to decrease. It's possible that this could be an explanation for things like or some of the things that happen during the menopause. Uh, and possibly something known as menopause, although there may not be as much evidence for menopause, although there seems to be a building amount of evidence that that are changes that occur in the male as well, where sex hormone production and pituitary function begin to change with age. I don't even know how many of these hypothalamic hormones we've gone through. I guess four, maybe three, four. Tropin releasing hormone or CRH. <clears throat> the main purpose of CRH is going to be for CRH to cause a release of ACTH, which is adenocorticotropic hormone, which results in release of glucocorticoids.
Am I missing one? Oh, well, growth hormone, releasing hormone, we didn't ever really talk about, uh, but we'll come back and we'll talk about that. So growth hormone, releasing hormone would be um, another hormone that you release from the hypothalamus. And then the last one that I'm going to kind of introduce you to before we start to get deeper on all of these. I put a question mark there. The reason I put a question mark there <clears throat> is because even though we know prolactin is produced by the pituitary, we're not sure if prolactin is actually caused to be released from the pituitary. In fact, there is no physiological that's known to cause prolactin to be released. Now, I've already given you that TRH, we know, has a small effect. It's only a small effect, and it does not look like it's going to account for the data that we have on prolactin release. And so you have two different options. <clears throat> the two options are that prolactin is just unregulated, or that prolactin can be turned on and off because it's inhibited. And so prolactin is constantly produced by the pituitary but can be turned off by an inhibiting substance. And it turns out that this is probably the correct answer. In fact, this is the correct answer. So prolactin is actually inhibited. And we're going to actually go through some of the history here on how this was, was kind of characterized. And so there is another hormone that's produced by the hypothalamus that's now known by a couple different names, prolactin inhibiting factor, PIF. You will all know this. But don't. So dopamine is produced by the health hypothalamus. It has this effect of being an inhibitor of prolactin. And so turns out that when you do that experiment where you remove the pituitary and place it in the kidneys, we observed what happens to ovaries, the adrenal glands, but we didn't talk about everything that happens in the ovaries. <coughs> so let's stop all of this right now. This one. What, what PRL, prolactin. So the end of the story really is that we have a prolactin inhibiting substance. Uh, it's dopamine, which acts as the prolactin inhibiting substance. And prolactin, one of the things that it does, one of the observations that you can make, is it maintains this structure in the ovary called the corpus luteum. And we're going to take a look at this in, in rats. Okay, so really quickly, get you up on corpus luteum. Okay, so this is an ovary. Ovary releases an egg. This is the uterine, right? We have the fimbria, which sweep the ovary when it's released. That ovary is released, and it gets swept up into the uterine tube. The structure that's left over after the release of that ovum forms this structure that's called the corpus luteum. Uh, the corpus luteum. Okay, so the corpus luteum is going to form 
prolactin is going to maintain that structure. And it turns out that that structure, oh, you know what? I have a picture. Let me just show you the picture. Okay, so there's a picture of what I just drew. So we're left over with this structure. It's basically like a star of where ovulation had occurred in the ovary. And what happens is the corpus luteum becomes an endocrine producing tissue that if fertilization occurs will maintain a high level of progesterone for about the first nine to 10 weeks of pregnancy in humans to maintain the uterine environment. And then eventually the placenta itself is gonna take over the maintenance of that uterus, okay? So for about 10 weeks, we have to maintain the uterus. And so we maintain the corpus luteum. It becomes an endocrine producing tissue. Prolactin is involved in that maintenance. Okay? So now let's take a look at an experiment here. If I remove the pituitary and relocate it to the kidney tap, we now understand that this basically cuts off hypothalamic control. So we remove the interaction with the parvocellular neurosecretory system. We cut off that hypothalamic control. And what we observed the last time that we discussed this just a few minutes ago is the ovaries underwent atrophy. The adrenals underwent atrophy. However, when we observe histologically what's going on in the ovaries, that structure, the corpus luteum, ends up being maintained. And ovulation is stopped. So ovulation ceases. And so in, in one sense, when we do this experiment, we sort of mimic the beginning stages of pregnancy in the back. If we go and take a look at the tissue of the pituitary, and specifically look at lactotropes. So these are the cells. So we put the pituitary, this is the pituitary that was in the kidney capsule. Now we go and take a look at that histologically, right? So we prep some slides, do some staining of that tissue. What we're going to observe is there are cells that have actually undergone, they've undergone hypertrophy. They've gotten bigger. These are the lactotrophs. So the lactotrophs are the cells that produce prolactin. So the lactotrophs undergo hypertrophy. So let's kind of review what we've just done here. We dismantled the connection between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. We've had regression of tissues, but we've observed that corpus luteum has now been maintained. And so ovulation does not continue. We don't continue the cycle. And when we look at that tissue that was transplanted to the capsule of the kidney, and we take a look at the cells, there's one group of cells that undergo an increase in size, and those are the lactotrophs. So these lactotrophs, again, are the cells in the pituitary that act to produce prolactin. And so the observation that we can make here is that 
the increase in cell size would indicate that, per, that per, prolactin is being produced. The pause of ovulation and maintenance of the corpus luteum would indicate that prolactin is being produced. And so when we split the pituitary from the hypothalamus, all these other tissues, they stop regulating, being regulated, except for the corpus luteum. And so prolactin actually, it, it would appear, and now we've confirmed this with concentration measurements, prolactin levels actually increase when we dysregulate from the hypothalamus. So it turns out that you have dopamine that's being released, right? This is kind of the end of the story. Dopamine that's constantly being released that causes prolactin levels to be held down under normal physiological circumstances. When you lift that normal physiological circumstance, you remove the inhibiting substance. You basically prevent that inhibiting substance from working. Prolactin levels go up. Okay, what words are we struggling with? Oh, that last one there. What's that? Cells in the pituitary. So if you're watching on YouTube, I also want you to know that uh, I'm 39 years old, and when I was 32 and 37, I suffered massive strokes. So I'm happy to be able to just sit here. I don't know. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I'm lying. I only had three strokes, not two. <laughs> I had no strokes. I know. Well, you, you guys, are, you guys watch The Office. You all have. Yes. Yeah. When he's talking about rabies, <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, three people suffer from rabies every year, die from or die from rabies every year. False. Four. <laughs> I love that show. <clears throat> all right. Um, I don't know. Okay, so cells in the pituitary. <clears throat> these are the prolactin producers, right? The prolactin producing cells. And so they continue to produce prolactin when they're dysregulated from the hypothalamus. So if we now take that pituitary, same pituitary tissue, remove it, and then replace it back close to where it's supposed to be, uh, so the median eminence. which now we're basically back in the neighborhood with the hypothalamus. We undergo that revascularization. You know, at the time that these experiments were done, they're still characterizing the parvo uh, cellular neurosecretory system. And so probably what has happened here is that that connection is reestablished between the neurons that are producing the horn releasing and inhibiting hormones and the pituitary. And when that is done, even in an animal that you basically do a dual surgery where you remove the pituitary, put it in the kidney capsule, block progression of the tissues, and then take it and put it back in the median eminence and it revascularizes, you end up with cycling. So ovulation doesn't stop, ovulation now continues, and we undergo a four to five day cycle daily in rodents. So under normal physiological circumstances, dopamine is constantly released from the hypothalamus. It interacts with those lactotropes in the pituitary to prevent the function. So we do not constantly, we do not constantly produce prolactin. Now, there are certain times when prolactin is needed. Prolactin is involved in uh, the nursing process for mammals, right? So the release of milk or milk let down. And so we actually want to lift that inhibition, allow prolactin to, to, to cycle, to, to circulate, protect the corpus luteum so that we don't have ovulation. Because when you're pregnant, you, wanna, you don't want to ovulate again because the, the next result after ovulation is to have uterine sloughing, and if you have a, a fetus that's growing and you slough the uterine lining, the baby's going later, right? So we want to prevent that from happening. We also want to prepare the mammary tissue to be able to feed that child or that baby 
So one of the uh, hallmarks of physiology is the feedback system. We have negative feedback loops and we have positive feedback loops. It turns out that there's more variation here than just negative and, 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 uh, and positive. We have what are known as long feedback loops as well. This is another characterization for feedback loops. So long loops are just simply going to basically, they're going to be or negative influences that are further away within an endocrine axis. And I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of give you an example here in just a second. I'm draw some stuff out. If we have long, we probably have short. And so these are structures that are anatomically closer together. So a short feedback loop, for example, the pituitary feedback uh, feeding back onto the hypothalamus. But we also have what are called auto inhibition and auto feedback loops. And so this is going to be the hormone that's produced by a tissue causes that tissue of production to change its function as that hormone increases in concentration. Auto inhibition, auto feedback. So you have long feedback loops, short feedback loops, and then auto feedback loops. So let's talk through an example. And we're going to put this in the context of what's called a uh, endocrine, <coughs> excuse me, an endocrine axis. So we can model these relationships in an axial structure. And we can add in the different regulatory things that are occurring. So I'm going to give you an example of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal cortex axis. And we're going to look at cortisol and how cortisol is regulated. So we're going to start out with what are known as higher brain centers. Higher brain centers are the neurological tissue that responds to both internal and external environmental stimuli or changes. So we have some sort of change that occurs in that higher brain center. And actually, let's do this. Let's get rid of the square around the right. The higher brain center is going to send a signal to the hypothalamus in response to the stimuli. So the hypothalamus is a defined tissue. That's why I'm putting the box on. So the hypothalamus is a defined tissue. Now the hypothalamus interacts with what tissue? Okay, which is also a defined tissue. So we have the hypothalamus, and then the pituitary, and then the pituitary causes changes to the adrenal cortex in this particular model. Right, we could do the same thing with the gonadal axis. The pituitary is going to cause a change in the function of the adrenal cortex. Okay? So this is the axis. This is the central line of our axis. Now, the question becomes, how does the hypothalamus interact with the pituitary in this particular axis? Well, it's through our hormone CRH. All right, so CRH is produced. 
circulates to the pituitary, causes the pituitary to generate and release ACTH. ACTH circulates to the adrenal cortex, causing the adrenal cortex to release, produce and release cortisol. Okay. So there is all of our tissues that are involved and the individual hormones. So there's just three hormones. The next thing that we can draw in here is we can start to look at our different feedback loops. Okay. And so we're actually going to start out here with ACTH. ACTH actually feeds back onto the hypothalamus. And so as ACTH is produced, feeds back in a negative fashion onto the hypothalamus to begin to cause the hypothalamic release of CRH to change. So going back to feedback regulation, we have long, short, and auto feedback loops. This would be an example of a short feedback loop. ACTH back to the hypothalamus. Now it also turns out that ACTH affects the pituitary as well. And it inhibits the pituitary, so it's another negative or inhibiting, inhibiting process. This is where the ACTH is being produced, so this is an example of auto inhibition or an auto feedback loop or auto feedback inhibition loop, whatever you want. Then we also have cortisol, and cortisol affects the pituitary and also affects the hypothalamus. Now, when cortisol levels increase, they cause ACTH levels to decrease. When cortisol levels increase, they cause CRH levels to decrease. Both of these on this side are examples of long. Okay, so now you kind of get the flavor here of the different feedback loops. Short because we're still in the neighborhood. Auto because the ACTH is inhibiting the tissue that's producing it. And then long because the adrenal cortex is not in the neighborhood of the hypothalamus. Of the pituitary. Okay, <clears throat> so these are These are important models in ways that we can look at individual endocrine interactions and how those hormones are ultimately regulated. Go ahead. Okay, so you'll be able to identify a long feedback loop because that long feedback loop is going to be your end hormone. So in this case, cortisol is our end hormone, right? This is ultimately what's being produced in this particular axis. And it has feedback regulation back up to the neighborhood of the hypothalamus and the pituitary. Now, in some cases, some of these endocrine axes, you'll actually have that end hormone also influence the function of the higher brain centers. Okay, so most of the time, it's going to be this inhibition of the last hormone in the process on hypothalamus and pituitary, but occasionally you also see a higher brain center interaction. When it comes down to the short inhibition, or the short feedback loops, I should say, these are going to be 
the pituitary hormone itself influences or inhibits the hypothalamus. And then auto is typically the pituitary influencing itself. I've never seen a situation where the hypothalamus auto inhibits or auto regulates only the pituitary. All right, so let's take a look at a couple more of these endocrine axes. The hormone that we didn't talk a whole lot about was growth hormone releasing hormone, which is involved in the regulation of growth hormone. So we can take a look at we take a look at uh, growth hormones. So starting with the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus produces two different hormones that are involved in growth hormone regulation. Does anyone remember what those are? Starts with an S. Yep, so somatostatin. And the other one was growth hormone release. Okay. So somatostatin, the other name for it was growth hormone inhibiting hormone. So both of those affect the pituitary to alter how growth hormone is released. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I should put the growth hormone out there, but I want to say. So growth hormone is released, and one of the target tissues for growth hormone is the liver. And the liver, which is not an endocrine, a primary endocrine, is not a primary endocrine organ, does produce certain molecules. One of those is the somatomedins, and it, basically that's a, a body, that's soma mediating, means a body mediating substance. An example here is IGF-1, which is the first isoform Growth okay, so this is actually going to cause changes in growth, and it has nothing to do with insulin other than it looks similar chemically to insulin. So it's not, it's not. Don't don't confuse this with being okay. So this is like an insulin-like molecule, so it helps out with glucose regulation. It's a growth factor that looks like insulin. Okay, so we know that somatostatin has a negative influence. Growth hormone, releasing hormone has a positive influence on releasing growth hormone. We have two long feedback loops here. IGF-1 has, it has its levels increased. It actually causes <coughs> an upregulation in somatostatin, whereas it will cause a downregulation in growth hormone release, which actually makes sense, right? Because as growth hormone levels increase and IGF levels increase, we want to keep them from becoming so overly produced that they have massive, massive influences. 
all right? So we inhibit the release of growth hormone, and we inhibit we inhibit the release of growth hormone through inhibiting the, the, the releasing hormone, and we enhance that um, inhibition by increasing the fitness. So what are they? these? These are what kind of feedback loops? They are long feedback loops. Growth hormone itself also influences both G, H, R, H, and somatostat, again, in a positive and a negative uh, perspective here as well. And so those are examples of short feedback loops. Okay. So we'll go ahead and we'll call it quits there and pick up with uh, the rest of this on Tuesday after your quiz.